from the studios of Channel 12, I Believe in Miracles, with a message of hope and music of inspiration, with your host, Pastor John Michael. And today we want to dedicate this program to the farmer that has a television in his combine. Anyway, we're happy to come to you this harvest season, and I want to talk to you about the expression lily of the valley. Lily of the valley is a term that is used poetically uh, as a title for Jesus Christ in music. And uh, one of the songs we're going to do tonight does, does just that. Anyway, uh, when you find that expression in the book of Song of Solomon or the Canticles of the Old Testament, it refers to the, 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 the bride uh, of Solomon in that story. And um, as I think about that, I think, you know, if the bride is described as a lily of the valley, then the groom has even a greater luster and beauty. And this is what the song's about. The lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, he's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. This is the description of who Jesus is to those who believe. Marilyn's going to play it. There was a pastor who was known as the, the smiling minister. Uh, he was a happy guy, sanguine, uh, optimistic, and he had a great ministry with children, and uh, people liked to be around him. Anyway, um, <clears throat> it reminds me of a little poem my mother taught me. It says, smile a while, and while you smile, another smiles. And soon there are miles and miles of smiles just because you smile. And that's the kind, it was, he was infectious. He smiled and he brought joy to many people. Well, he hit upon hard times. And in this book I have in my hand, which is called Then Sings My Soul, uh, there's this story. It quotes Charles Haddon Spurgeon as saying, the joyous are not always happy. I'll repeat that and let it sink in. The joyous are not always happy because a series of heartbreaks uh, shattered the spirit of this happy Christian minister. And uh, Frank Greff was his name. He found himself un in unfamiliar valleys of deep depression and despondency. His gloom became as great as the bliss he had previously known. At length, he collapsed into the everlasting arms and he found himself singing an old hymn. And this brought him to write this hymn. It asks a question, and then it confidently answers the question. Marilyn? The 
Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth and song? As the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long. Oh, yes, he cares, I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know Savior cares. Does Jesus care when I've tried and failed to resist some temptation so wrong? When for my deep grief I find no relief Though my tears flow all the night long, does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me? And my sad heart aches till it breaks is it aught to him does he care oh yes he cares I know he cares his heart is touched with my grief when the day It's dreary, I know my Savior cares. And cast all of our anxiety upon him, for he does care for you and for me. 1 Peter 5, 7 ought to be a favorite. It's one you ought to memorize. No matter what version you read it in, it's going to be good. And casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Well, this is, this is the harvest time. And it's just wonderful to, to uh, know that the farmers are out in the fields. It's a joyous time. It's a busy time. It's a time of hard work. It's a time of long hours. It's a time of filling up the granaries and the bins and uh, getting ready. I'm thinking about uh, a verse in the book of Psalms in chapter 126 where it says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goes forth and weeps bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. That's from Psalms 126 in the Old Testament. Well, I read in the Bible, in my daily Bible reading, I'm reading in what's called the Chronological Bible. And the Chronological Bible takes uh, the, the accounts of Scripture and puts them in consecutive order, uh, close to it, the way that the, the, the dates that they happened or were written. And uh, so in my reading now, I'm in the Gospels, and uh, in the gospel, this week in the Gospel of John in chapter 4 about the woman at the well. <clears throat> now Jesus said with his disciples he was going to go through Samaria. When he got to the well, he sent them into town uh, to get food, but he waited at the well. And then a lady came to draw from the well and he asked her for water. And she was surprised that he being a Jew would ask a Samaritan for water. But... Uh, in the conversation that he had with her one-on-one, -on -one, and I like to think of this program as being just a conversation one-on-one. -on -one. I'm 
I'm alone, and very likely you're alone. Maybe there's several with you, but I want to speak to you individually, one at a time. I want to just share my heart with you, and I want your heart to be encouraged, your heart to be comforted, your heart to be instructed, hopefully in some way. Now, I'm just a, a simple preacher who grew up on a farm, and I try to plant seeds. The good seeds I try to plant are the seeds of God's Word, to plant them in your heart and let them grow. And it says that if we sow those seeds with compassion, that ultimately there will be a harvest that will be a happy time. Well, it's harvest season, and this is the time that um, in southern Minnesota, northern Iowa, is very important. So, as I'm thinking about this passage, I come to verse number, number 35 in chapter number 4. And uh, he says to his disciples, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Don't say that there are four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Jesus said, something to, is more important to me than food, and that is doing the will of God. And then he says, don't think in terms of the growing season. 120 days might be a typical growing season, from the time you plant the seed in the ground till the time you harvest the, the, the fruit of the crop. And he says, don't think in terms of waiting four months before you put in the harvest. Harvest is now. Harvest is ready. For there's always a harvest. In every generation there's a harvest. It's a needy time. As I look in my Bible, he says, lift up your eyes. I met a man, or I talked to a man just this week, who said, admitted, as an, uh, a man older than I am, he said, I don't listen. I don't listen. And uh, I guess that's true of a lot of us. We don't listen. It's good to train our ears to hear, to hear what other people say, and to listen carefully, especially when it comes to God's Word. He said, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes to see, catch a vision, did you know that there is a place on the internet where you can go and see the population of the world as it's happening? <clears throat> it's uh, clicking off over 7 billion people in the world. How many are being born at the present time? The numbers are ticking away. 170,000 when I looked at it this afternoon. 170, um, and, 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 it, and the other numbers are there. How many are dying and how, many, uh, how much gain there is? And it's, it's, it's constantly moving and changing. Yes, we should lift up our eyes and see the present need in the world. It says of Jesus that he, he, when he saw the multitude, when he saw the multitudes in his day, he was moved with compassion. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him that is, the Father has laid on the Son the iniquity of us all. Yes, we are as sheep that have gone astray. There were ninety and nine that safely lay in the shelter of the fold. But one was out on the hills away, far off from the gates of gold. And so the shepherd leaves the ninety and nine, and he goes after the one lost sheep. And when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulder and brings it home, rejoicing. You see, the harvest is a time of rejoicing. When a wayward boy comes home, it's a time of rejoicing. When a prodigal daughter comes back, it's a time of rejoicing. When a sinner comes to the cross, it's a time of rejoicing. When a child sheds tears and asks for forgiveness, it's a happy moment for the child as well as the parent. Lift up your eyes and see the present need. The word others is a powerful word. There's a story that took, play, took place back in 1910. William Booth, who was uh, the founder of the Salvation Army, was gravely ill. 
and the convention was meeting. It was Christmas time. The convention was meeting, and he knew he would he would be able to be there to to speak to the thousands that would gather, to be inspired by his words. And so somebody suggested. They said, um, "Well, uh, maybe he could send a telegram." And so that's just exactly what happened. He wrote a telegram and it was sent. And so at the convention where thousands of delegates were meeting, the moderator announced that Booth would not be able to be present because of his failing health and his eyesight. And gloom and pessimism swept over the floor of the convention. And then the moderator announced that Booth had sent a message. The message was to be read with the opening of the first session. So he opened the telegram and he read the one word message, others. It was signed General Booth. That's a telegram that of course has inspired the Salvation Army for decades and it should inspire every Christian, others. Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be. Lift up your eyes and see. See the needs of others. Myopia is nearsightedness. It's narrow vision. And many times we see only our own issues and we fail to see the issues of others. But in Philippians chapter 2 it says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. We are to be compassionate and kind and helpful to those that are others. Lift up your eyes and see others who are about you. I also want to suggest to you that we can lift up our hands. Lift up our hands to work. Harvest time is a, a time of long hours, as long as the weather allows, late into the night, sometimes all the night long. There is the, the bringing in of the crop. The ant is an example of those who are industrious. It says, go to the ant, you sluggard. A lazy man cannot be a farmer. A, 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 a farmer who is lazy is not a good farmer, for a farmer has to be diligent in the time of harvest. There are six days to labor, the Ten Commandments says, but then there's one day to rest. But in the time of harvest, we need to remember that old song that says, work for the night is coming. Work in the morning hours. Work when the sun is at its peak. Lur work when evening shadows come. Every stanza of that song tells us to work, to work. Onward Christian soldiers, uh, onward Christian soldiers, marching as to war. It's time to go to the battle. It's time to go to the field. It's time to lift up your hands and work. It might be to pick up the sword to defend. And it might be to uh, pick up the trowel to build a wall. Anyway, lift up your hands to work and also lift up your hands to give. One of my favorite texts on industry is found in the book of Ephesians. And in chapter number four, it tells those who have been taking advantage of others who have been stealing, who have, been, um, who, have, who have not been taking care of themselves. It says, uh, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor. So there comes work and industry. Working with his hands. The thing that is good that he may have to possess so that he can give to him that needs. So it shows that as God enabled you with strength to work so that you can earn, so that you can have, then you should include being able to assist and aid, stewardship, tithing, giving, offerings and alms, helping missions and projects. Lift up your hands and labor. Lift up your eyes and work. But I want you to see this verse in another light as well. And I say it this way, lift up your heart. Lift up your heart to pray. 
In that passage in Matthew chapter 9 where Jesus saw the multitudes and was moved with compassion, he saw them as sheep having no shepherd. Then he said, Pray ye therefore, pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Yeah, harvest's time is a time when farmers maybe need to, to call in others to help them. They need to get a hired hand to assist. And here is the prayer Jesus taught them to pray. Pray for laborers. The laborers are few. The harvest is plenteous. There's more harvest than there is laborers. That's why Jesus said, this is an urgent message. This is a message we should feel um, a, 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 an inspiration to do something. I must do something. It's a, a challenge to pray for laborers. Some of us are getting too old to do much anymore. But there's one thing we can always do. Sitting in a care center, sitting in your own home, maybe even so weak you're in a hospital bed. You can pray. Pray for one missionary. Pray for one relative. Pray for one neighbor. Pray for one sorrowing soul, one widow, one widower. It is good to pray. Lift up your heart in prayer. In other words, express your trust in God and your confidence that even though you cannot do anything besides pray, God can do what we cannot do for ourselves or for others. Lift up your heart and pray, but also lift up your heart to care. You see, love and compassion have to come from some spring, some fountain, some deep well. And the deep well is the Savior. The Savior inspires us to love. If we follow his example, if we follow in his steps, we will go in the path of service. There is joy in serving Jesus. Because he cares, we should follow his example. I would spoke to you about the missionary that went out from our church back in the early 80s who went down to Peru. He and his wife found a little cottage where the, where the widow lady said, you can rent a room to sleep in. And he said, well, I will rent it if you'll let us use your living room for church service. And the first, that was on a Saturday night, they moved into this little room. On Sunday morning, they had church service. And in that room was the missionary, his wife, the widow lady, and her servant girl who was 12 years old. I think I told you before, that I met that servant girl. She's now in her 40s. She has a son that's studying in the United States. She has a daughter. They're a Christian family. This is inspiring. You see, I think of that school where we went to celebrate the 25th anniversary. And I think, yeah, one of the graduates of that, graduates of that school who graduated when he was 16, came to America, studied in Christian schools and colleges here, and went on to be a pastor. He's now a pastor to Hispanic people in California. Lift up your heart and pray and care for others. Care for your own people. Care for your own neighbors. Care for your own family. And let me add this concluding, concluding remark, and that is not only lift up your eyes and see others, not only lift up your hands and work and give, not only lift up your heart and pray and care, but also lift up your feet and go. It was Peter who went to the house of Cornelius <laughs> and he brought him the good news of Christ and the Messiah and salvation. Here was a Gentile man, a Roman centurion, who accepted the Lord. His family accepted the Lord. All because Peter left Joppa and he went to Caesarea. There's another story. Ananias went to a, a bad man he was told to go to a bad man, a man who, who caused trouble for Christians. He was a, 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 a harsh and, and uh, uh, he, he, he was a persecutor. But he went to Saul. He went to Saul. And he said, your life is going to be different. You're going to be a light to the Gentiles. 
as well as the Jews. So Paul could say when he wrote his letter, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, but also to the Gentile and to the Greek. Yeah, it was Ananias and Sapphira. They went to church one day and heard a young preacher preach. This is in Acts chapter 19. And they saw he was young and he was immature and they took him. They, they went to him and they spent time with him and they taught him the way of the Lord more perfectly. They helped to mature a young preacher who was an outstanding preacher. And so it is. You can touch somebody's life. Maybe you can lift up your feet and go. You can pray this prayer, Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I humbly and nobly do my part to bring that soul to thee. Lord, would you open the eyes of those who do not see? Would you open the hearts of those who do not believe? Would you inspire all of us to follow your example and to you your good, do your good will? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. While we're here to help you find your way, we hope that you can find your way to the cross, that you can find your way to faith, that you can find your way to forgiveness, not only to receive it, but also to give it to others, and that you can find your way to the blessed hope. It's been a joy to come to you this harvest season, and, uh, and we hope to see you again next week. Until then, goodbye, and God bless you. You've been listening to program number 2274. If you have any comments or inquiries regarding this telecast, please address them to Miracles, P.O. Box 128, Mankato, Minnesota, 56002, and refer to program number 2274. I Believe in Miracles is a ministry of Grace Baptist Church in Mankato.